Welcome back to another exciting episode of Mastermind Discussions. I'm your host, Matthew LaCroix. And today, on episode number 10, I'm joined by returning guest Brian Forrester, renowned ancient history researcher and writer, to discuss the mysteries of elongated skulls, ancient civilizations, and lost history. Brian, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down to talk to me. How are you, my friend? It's a pleasure, Matt. Thank you very much. Great. Well, I really look forward to continue our conversation where we left off last time. For those who didn't get a chance to see our, our previous discussion, uh, we did a little over a month ago, um, we discussed uh, Brian's background with how he got into studying megalithic structures and the sophistication of a lot of these ancient sites of antiquity. And then we got into speculating on what some of their purposes would have been and how they were created. But today, we're going to go deeper. We're going to go another layer below that. And we're going to try to understand why these strange elongated skulls exist all over the world and a lot of these really ancient sites that tie directly into, in many cases, having evidence of older civilizations than were there after. So we find evidence in most cases of sophistication in a lot of these sites when we're finding these megalithic um, and elongated skulls, like in places like Egypt and in places like South America. So we're going to get into talking about these mysteries of elongated skulls, try to understand the various influences of some of these lost civilizations of antiquity, and get into some of the possibly the, the technology they had during that time period. So Brian, to get us started here, just to get on the surface level here, what got you started with looking into these mysteries of elongated skulls in particular? Well, I saw them um, being displayed on TV growing up on different, um, different shows and, and they, you know, very strange looking things. And, uh, then about, uh, 13 years ago, I saw one in a very small museum here in Peru. It was a mummified skull, uh, including the neck, uh, kind of gruesome for some people to look at, but I, having a pre-med background, I was absolutely fascinated by them. I looked up in the literature, and in every case, the academics say that they're all the result of the binding of a baby's head. But uh, some of these are just so complicated in terms of their shapes and curvature that I thought um, that maybe that's not the case. M maybe there was the possibility that some of these were actually born that way, which um, is what we seem to be discovering. Yeah, it, it is odd, isn't it? So. We have two different situations here, right? On one, in one case, there's the idea that's, that cranial um, enlargement is done to, to create this, this head-looking structure where it's, it's, it's elongated at the top. And then there's this other idea that, well, no, it's perhaps some kind of a genetic trait. So I want to just go a little further on that. We find currently, we find elongated skull evidence um, in places like Peru, up into Mexico, with the Olmec possibly, and then of course over into Egypt with a lot of the pharaohs and possibly pre-dynastic pharaohs especially. Were these skulls common to just all men members of society or were we finding, are you, is your research finding that, that the evidence is showing that these skulls are part of a more subgroup of that culture? Yeah, it's basically the nobility. So the priestly class, the, the chiefly class, um, they were the ones that had the elongated skulls to differentiate themselves from the common population. So you find that that's the case in Peru and Bolivia and Melanesia and the Congo and near Stonehenge, all over ancient Europe and other locations. So it, it wasn't just that anybody would have an elongated skull. It was the absolute elite exclusively in, I think, every case. Yeah, so it's not just that all the cultures had these genetics and they're all walking around with the elongated skulls, but it was more of this, like you said, this nobility class that was from possibly some kind of a genetic background. And that's where I, I want to lead into the next question. When we're looking at this and we're, as I, as I said earlier in the show, there's this perception by modern academia in, in a lot of mainstream um, circles where that these, the results of these elongated skulls are from cranial enlargement just because they wanted to look maybe smart or w if they were trying to mimic these uh, noble, noble bloodline cultures. But 
The question is, is it just to look a certain way or is there some genetic testing that tells that this isn't just what it seems on the surface and there may be some anomalies with the fact that this may be an actual genetic trait, right? Yeah, well, most of the, in most of the ancient cultures, and this is most common, but not exclusively, about 2,000 years ago, that the, uh, the baby's head, as soon as they were born, would be bound in order to alter the shape. Um, and physically, they look quite similar to um, a normal human skull, except the forehead and the back of the head are flattened. So that, that distorts the shape of the skull. But in the case of um, some of the cultures in Peru, especially the Paracas culture, the cranial volume is greater. So you, you can't achieve that from simply changing the shape of the head. And also there's certain other characteristics. The, uh, the suture that comes down this way, because we have a, a suture that comes across this way on our skull, and also one that comes back that way, and they interconnect here. This suture is completely missing in the original ones of the Paracas culture, which is, you know, I've had at least 40 medical professionals come and look at them and they can't figure out what's going on because that suture has to be there. Um, also the eye sockets are sometimes 50% larger than normal. There are two little holes in the back of the skull, which uh, turns out is for blood and nerve flow. And that's not common in a, in, in a normal skull. And then as well, the foramen magnum, which is where your spinal column enters the bottom of your skull. With us, it's in the perfect balance point in the center. But with these ancient elongated skulls, it's actually as much as an inch back of where it should be. And that again has to be genetic. Because if you, tr you, know, if you try to bind a baby's neck in order to alter the position of the, of the foramen magnum, you would kill it in less than two minutes. It, it just seems like there's this entire other side of human history that we're seeing in these, this genetic testing and these elongated skulls that speaks to a completely different period when we had potentially different genetics than just Homo sapiens sapien. This seems to be part of something totally different, which leads me to the next question, Brian. There are more than a 40 elongated skulls in Paracas, Peru, near, nearby where you are. And you've, you've studied them very extensively, possibly more than anyone else in the world. Um, and I want you to expand on what is significant about the fact that their hair color is red or blonde. Are we seeing that with any of the indigenous cultures in the region? No, that's another major characteristic that you point out. And um, yeah, any, any, any of the most ancient elongated skulls here in Paracas, Peru, uh, the nobility, they were all dark red headed. And in some cases, blonde headed ones have been found. And uh, there are two hair experts that examined more than 200 samples of the Paracas uh, hair. And they both said that it's a genetic characteristic. So that's not a Native American characteristic, which obviously means that the original Paracas must have originated from somewhere else and migrated to the coast of Peru. Well, I mean, that would completely rewrite our history books, right? I mean, what you just said, that statement may just seem simple to some that don't study this, but according to modern academia, these cultures had no connection with those across the ocean in places like the Turkey and Black Sea area. But yet, yet we're finding genetic evidence that proves otherwise. And so we're, we're looking at something completely different that really rewrites this human story. And, and I think that's what... You, you sort of went into the next question I wanted to ask you about, but tell me a little bit more about how you're finding concrete genetic testing that's showing that a percentage of these um, elongated skulls have origins back to the Black Sea Turkey area. Can you just talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, well, uh, we did DNA testing of 22 Paracas elongated skulls, and um, if they were pure Native American, then their maternal haplogroup would have been B, which is what uh, the native population of Peru and uh, much of the Americas is, because that shows migration across the Bering Land Bridge of their ancestors. But of the 22 skulls we sampled, only two were haplogroup B. The others were um, 
H, H1, H2, K, U2, U2, E1. And the commonality of all of those other haplogroups is the area of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, because that's where the other largest elongated skulls in the world have been found. Okay, so we do genetic testing. We get these anomalies that point towards a genetic connection to the Black Sea caucus area. And then the real question now is, does this, does this give us any information at all about when these people migrated to this region? Do we have any information on that based on this evidence? Well, the common belief is that the Paracas uh, culture arose about 800 BC and then disappeared about 100 AD. And that is contemporary with the elongated skulls that have been found in the area of the Black Sea and the Caucasus. So, so they were living at the same time and they died out at about the same time as well. So to me, that shows uh, through the genetics that clearly there was a migration from the Black Sea, Caspian Sea area to the coast of Peru, somewhere around 800 BC. Would you- And possibly, or possibly earlier. Would, would you wanna speculate based on anything that you've looked at about why they may have wanted to come to that particular reason, region in particular? I mean, you come from a, a relatively lush area in that, in that area to grow crops and to live. Why come here, Brian? What's the reason to come to South America? Well, I think they were forced out. You know, that's the common thing in, in history is that um, a cult, you know, cultures over the course of time almost everywhere have been displaced because of uh, invasion of some kind. And so I think that's kind of the logical thing that happened. Uh, the Paracas, we found out uh, through looking at all the artifacts, they didn't really have weapons of warfare as far as we can tell. So they seem to have been a, a peaceful people. And that could have been the case with the people in the area of the Black Sea as well. Uh, I studied the wind and current patterns and it is plausible that they could have migrated based on wind and, um, and sea currents to make it from the Black Sea, Caspian Sea area to the coast of Peru. Okay. But th the thing that I'm having trouble with, Brian, is look today, and I know that, that the climate has changed since back then, but looking today at a place like Lake Titicaca, the area of the Tiwanaku culture and over into Pumapunku and then, and then getting into some of the other megalithic stuff we see in, in some of the mountainous areas just like Machu Picchu. It seems odd to me that these, at least connected to some of the sophistication that may be linked to these elongated skulls and these noble royal bloodlines, why build there though? Why not right on the coast? you know, where, where you can fish easily with the ocean. Why weigh up at some of the highest elevations possible? Do you have any, any reason or evidence you've shown for why that might've been the case? Well, that's one of the great enigmas. Um, one reason why the megalithic construction uh, was done in the highlands of Peru and the Altiplano of Bolivia, uh, or especially in the highlands of Peru, is the fact that there's a lot of stone there. You know, you're talking the Andes Mountains. So getting access to high quality stone was, was not a problem. On the coast of Peru, it's all sand. Uh, Paracas gets about half an inch of rain a year. So what we find here is that the, um, the Paracas people built like very large pyramidal structures out of adobe mud, bricks. Um, that's the only material they had. Very interesting. So, I mean, that would tell a story right there is, well, were those cultures actually connected? And I guess that's what leads into my next question. When we, when we look at South America in particular, we look at all these incredible sites, right? Like, so the megalithic structures in, outside of Cusco and Alete Tambo, and then as we mentioned, Tiwanaku and Machu Picchu, we see all this sophisticated building, but we see in many cases an absence of finding these tombs with all these you know, elongated skulls found within them and it, it said it seems like they're mostly empty. And whereas we're finding these elongated skulls along the coast in places like Paracas, where there is, like you said, there's a lack of that type of stone and sophisticated building in those areas, but that's where the skulls are. So maybe you could help me connect those two pieces and, and perhaps it's even linked to the Spanish conquistadors in some way. 
Okay, well, actually, in the highlands of Peru, at all the megalithic sites, and uh, they're located in many different locations, uh, you do find evidence of elongated skull people living there, uh, about the same size as the ones found in Paracas. So uh, many elongated skulls were found at Machu Picchu during early excavations and at Oyente Tambo, which is in the Sacred Valley of Peru, also at Pumapunku and, and uh, Tiwanaku as well. So the basic story, at least for the highlands of Peru, appears to be that um, when the Nazca people moved from the north into the Paracas territory about 100 AD, they displaced the Paracas people and uh, attempted genocide. But I believe that many of them were able to escape because there is an ancient road that connects Cusco with Paracas. It's now a major highway, but uh, major highways in Peru are built upon ancient roads that existed before. And so it's quite probable that um, some of the Paracas escaped around 100 AD and made it up into the highlands of Peru and became the seed of what would later become the Inca culture. Because uh, again, red-headed elongated skulls have been found in the Cusco area. And um, yeah, and they, they were probably pre-Inca. Um, yeah, so that's that's the basic story. So then that would imply that the Paracas predated the Inca, like you said. So they were the original sophisticated builders that arrived on the shores of South America and then eventually moved inland. Is that what you're essentially saying? Well, actually, uh, the the megalithic works date back at least twelve and a half thousand years, which of course is not. Uh, something that academics will accept, but they're, they're so sophisticated in terms of their construction that it would require very modern machine tools to, in order to do construction of that nature. So definitely pre-Inca, because the Inca arrived in Cusco about uh, 1,000 years ago, but there obviously were people who were living there beforehand. Uh, descendants of the Paracas people likely were living there as well as others. Um, Okay, so yeah. then, so if, you, like you said, we're finding these elongated skulls and this unusual genetics within this royal no nobility, this royal class that potentially has those links all the way back till be, to, to before they migrated here, this strange people, right, that we know almost nothing about, that just arrived and had all this knowledge and technology, then based on that then, would you say then that the last Inca leader we have, this, this famous leader known as Atahualpa, that, you know, when Pizarro came on shore and then moved his way inland, he met this leader and they, they had these discussions and, Piz and Pizarro wanted to convert him over to Catholicism. And Atahualpa has these incredible quotes where he, instead of just laying down on his knees, he basically told him that he will be, you know, he'll, uh, I don't remember the exact quote, but he'll basically, he won't bow down on Pizarro and that he will be, be true to himself all the way to the end and because of that Pizarro ended up attacking him within a giant army and then capturing him and eventually killing him based on um, putting up a huge ransom of gold but the point I'm trying to make is after that happened the, the entire massive Incan empire the largest arguably the largest empire in the Americas subsequently collapsed after after that happened does that perhaps point to the fact that maybe Atahualpa, this, this leader, leader may have been the last, potentially. And I wanted to get your, your, base, your take on that based on the evidence you've studied. Could he have been the last of this royal noble line? And that's why the Inca fell apart so quickly. Well, I've done lots of research about the Inca. And uh, what actually happened is that five years before the Spanish arrived on the coast of Peru, uh, disease had made it uh, made its way from Panama because Panama was where their the base of the conquistadors was and so through trade through the trading networks uh, disease was passed from Panama down through the different tribal groups into the Inca world and uh, before the Spanish arrived more than half of the population had died of smallpox in the common cold and things like that so that's that's what actually uh, 
caused the collapse of the Inca civilization. It, it wasn't uh, the Spanish, but the, you know, the Spanish wound up wiping the whole thing out. Um, Atahualpa was actually one, he was one quarter Inca. Uh, he was three quarters um, Ecuadorian because his mother was Ecuadorian and his, uh, his father was born in Ecuador and he was one, he was one half Inca as well. Um, yeah, so that's actually what happened to the Inca. Also, there was, a, yeah, there was this massive civil war that went on as well just before the Spanish arrived. Uh, his brother, Huascar, was living in Cusco. He was to be the, deemed to be the next ruler uh, when the father died. And Atahualpa had the imperial army with him in the north in Ecuador. And so he sent the imperial army down south to Cusco to capture his brother and also to wipe out the Inca family, which they uh, actually did wind up doing. Uh, because He did that because uh, he didn't have he wasn't going to become the high Inca um, from a, a birthright since he was only one quarter Inca, whereas um, his, uh, his brother Huascar was probably 100% Inca. So he, out of jealousy, he decided to wipe out the royal Inca family in Cusco. And uh, that, that is what happened. A few children managed to survive and uh, one became a very famous author uh, afterwards. But uh, that's, yeah, that's the, the basic story of what happened to the Inca. The Spanish, of course, to this day claim that they were the ones who conquered, but uh, they, uh, that, that isn't really what happened. That, you know, that, you know, they're on their horses, in big statues of them showing how brave they were. Um, another thing about Atahualpa was uh, because the Spanish were so boastful and saying, you know, our king is, is uh, is the greatest king in the world. You know, our God is better than your God, et cetera, et cetera. He, at one point, uh, spoke through an interpreter and said, from where do you get this authority? And the priest who was with them took out the Bible and said, this is the word of God. And so he passed the Bible to Atahualpa. He took it and he put it up to his ear because he thought that the Bible was going to speak. And when he didn't hear anything, then he threw it on the ground. And that actually is the reason why he was executed was for desecrate, you know, desecrating the Bible according to the Spanish. Is that after they fulfilled the ransom of an entire building full of gold? Um, no, that's, that's when he became captured and then he was put into this building in the city of Cajamarca, which actually is megalithic. And uh, at that point uh, they were negotiating uh, because the Spanish were saying, we're, you know, we're going to kill you. And it's like, uh, he decided to stand on his tiptoes and touch as high as he could reach. And he said, I will fill this room once with gold and twice with silver if you let me go. And then he gave away the location of Cusco to them so that the Spanish could go and plunder Cusco. Uh, they didn't bring back enough gold in order to be able to cover the ransom, unfortunately, because most of the gold was in the form of thin golden sheets taken off the, uh, the walls of some of the most sacred, sacred temples in, in Cusco. Uh, and so it became a very complicated story because uh, in order for the uh, Spanish army to move south from Cajamarca into Cusco, they had to decide what to do with uh, Atahualpa. And they actually did find out that he was not the highest of the Inca, but that his brother Huascar was the highest and he was located in Cusco. So they had a, a choice to make, either take him with them to Cusco or kill him. And uh, they put up some mock charges that he had done all sorts of things, like he had betrayed his brother, that the gold that had arrived from Cusco had been illegally uh, taken from the Inca people, you know, things like that. So the trumped up charges were the result of why they, uh, why they killed him. They were going to burn him at the stake and, uh, he resisted, of course, and then they said, well, if you convert to Christianity, or more specifically Catholicism, then we'll garret you instead, you know, which is faster than, uh, than burning at the stake. And so he agreed to that. He was given a, a Spanish name, and then he was killed. Wow. So what's interesting to me about that, and then looking also into the Aztec and Mayan history, is that by the time these conquistadors landed on their shores 
these were almost like a, a shadow of their former self with these, with these empires and these cultures. This wasn't the, the proud display of these incredible, sophisticated megalithic cultures that have built all these walls. These were just later cultures that had inherited those structures and, and were largely, it seemed like, corrupt at that point. The Maya were doing blood sacrifice and the Aztec were doing all kinds of blood sacrifice and war. And then, as you said, the Inca, they were in the middle of civil wars and all of this turmoil. It just seems like unfortunate that, that even before the, the conquistadors landed, we, we were already seeing um, many of these incredible cultures already, like I said, just the shadows of their former selves at that point. But to me, what's interesting is, though, it still has those pieces of evidence to link back to this earlier time, this time when these sophisticated um, knowledge bringers had arrived on their shores or came wherever they came from and then brought this knowledge and created these incredibly sophisticated cultures from north to south. And so this brings in getting back into the genetic question. You've worked closely with someone that I have a lot of admiration for, the, the late Lloyd Pye just a, an incredible researcher and, and uh, genetics expert. Can you expand a little bit on what is known as a star child skull and what makes that significant? Sure, the star child skull, as far as I can re remember, was found in uh, Mexico in the 1930s. And it was brought back to the United States by a young woman who had it in her possession for a long time. <clears throat> and when she died, uh, the star child skull was actually given to Lloyd uh, to be the caretaker. Uh, and he did all sorts of tests. He did, all, he did genetic testing. He did uh, chemical testing of, of the bone and all sorts of things. And he found at least 25 anomalies of the star child that indicated that it wasn't human. One of the characteristics was that it has these black fibers inside the bone structure itself which is very weird. And then also he had a, a very difficult time in trying to take a, a, a sample to do ca um, carbon-14 testing because at that time, it's quite a while ago, you had to have quite a large piece in order to do uh, DNA and carbon-14 testing. So when he took a Dremel machine, which is you know a, a rotating machine to cut a piece of, the, of this bone out, he kept breaking the blades all the time. And so when they did the analysis of the bone itself, they found out that it was more like dental enamel than it was like human bone. So that's, uh, that's simply, those are simply two of the, of the strange characteristics of the star child skull. The funny thing is that we have one uh, of the skulls just like that in our little museum here in Paracas. So you're saying that it wasn't even made out of bone. It's some unusual type of, of bone-like structure, you said almost like an, an enamel. I mean, that would, how would that even work in like an, an evolutionary Darwinian look? How do we have this completely different structure of the skeletal structure and the, and the head structure of this skull? And then we have these elongated skulls. Are we talking about just completely different subgroups of humans or what's your take on that? Well, I think in the case of the star child, it could very well indicate, well, it, either indicates that it's a completely different species or that it is a star child skull in that it came from another planet. Uh, because supposedly when it was found, it was found in a, in a cave um, and the caretaker of this young child had uh, her arm wrapped around the baby and I guess they both died in the cave itself. Um, and then a, a big storm came and uh, water rushed into the cave and caused the, the skulls to be moved around and then out of the cave itself. And unfortunately, the bodies, or at least the body of the star ch child was never recovered. It se seemingly just was washed down through an arroyo or something like that. So that, that's the unfortunate thing is that there's no evidence of any other parts of, of the star child body itself except for the skull but it is it's very anomalous I, I haven't seen it in person but I was um, I was in correspondence quite closely with Lloyd for about three years he was going to come down to Peru and do a tour with me because he had been here once uh, I think with uh, with Sitchin 
uh, doing an Anunnaki study. And um, so he had seen the elongated skulls before, but he wanted to come down because we were going to focus an entire tour around him and, uh, and an analysis of, of the elongated skulls. Unfortunately, he rapidly developed cancer and died before, months before he was able to make it down to Peru. So it's very sad. I never got to meet him in person. That's terrible. Certainly he's taken well before his time. Well then, you know, expanding on that, on that area, you know, Lloyd's looking at South America. He's looking at some of those areas, for genetic testing to, to try to trace all this back. And meanwhile, I want to go a little bit further north in places like um, in near Veracruz, Mexico, we find this really unusual type of culture called the Olmec that built these enormous stone heads. Some of them were found far underneath the soil and had to be excavated out and, and they in these massive, very African-like features on these faces. And more importantly, the Olmec were even connected to, um, to the practice of rubber making, which if anyone studies that history of rubber making and some of those traits that are, go along with the Olmec, you see that it seems to potentially be connected back to Africa. What do you think your take on is with the Olmec in comparison to something like the Paracas people? Is, are these just two groups that came here from different places and, and then ended, ended up somewhere, somewhere else and developed independently? Or what's your, what is your view on that? Well, the Olmec are a very mysterious culture, just like the Paracas are. Because again, conventional academics will tell you that they, they were simply one of the oldest developed cultures in that part of Mexico that they developed there, you know, from the indigenous people. Um, but the, you know, some of the, the strange thing is if you actually physically go to Olmec uh, territory to, to this very day, you see two different types of people. You see the descendants of the Maya, who were very thin, uh, well, not very thin, they're, they're quite short, uh, relatively thin body frame. Um, and then you find descendants of another culture who are like six feet tall, six foot two, six foot four, uh, very African looking facial features. Um, and I, th I think they, that their ancestors did come from Africa because physically they look so much different. And um, if you study the wind currents, again, from the west coast of Africa, you'll see that the currents will take you into the Gulf of Mexico, if, if, even if you were floating on a log. So it, it does seem that the Olmec were descendants of ancient African people who made it into that part of Mexico it's like three or 4,000 years ago. And the heads are also really curious because they're made of basalt, which is a very hard stone. They're not all basalt, but many are. And they had no tools whatsoever to be able to shape it. Um, as you said, many of them were found with just the very top surface above the ground. And the rest, you know, these things weigh 10 to 20 or more tons. So the majority of the, of the stone itself was found underground. So I don't, in fact, think the Olmec made them. I think the Olmec discovered them. Um, and that they were made by a much more sophisticated culture a long, long time ago. Because if you go into the Jalapa Museum, which is in that part of Mexico, you see all sorts of artifacts that don't fit in with um, the capabilities of the cultures that existed at those times. There are these little spools shaped about this kind of size, uh, shaped like that, made out of obsidian, which is, is volcanic glass, perfectly polished, perfectly round, uh, we happened to be there once with an engineer from, retired mechanical engineer from the U.S., uh, David, and I said, David, look at these, because there are a whole series of these things lined up. And, uh, you know, they look like a spool where you would wind um, string or something on. And I said, do you think these could be made by hand? And he simply said, impossible. So that indicates that in ancient Mexico, they had lathes that were capable of, uh, of spinning and shaping volcanic glass, which would be a very difficult process. So that's the kind of stuff I look for when I go into these mu museums are what we call out of place artifacts. It says that one culture made them, uh, but when you see that that culture couldn't have made, you know, of course they use them. They use them actually as earplugs, uh, as a sort of ornamentation, but as David said, impossible for them to have made. Okay. so. We're beginning to get this picture that's emerging from ancient civilizations, right? It's not that 
Okay, so these cultures emerged out of the Americas. That's not what, it's, what the evidence is showing. And I think that's important that we establish this narrative to rewrite the story of history, the story of humanity, you could really call it. It seems like the evidence, like you're saying, from the Olmec and the Maya and the Aztec, whatever you want to call those cultures, right? The evidence that's there, as well as these, the Paracas people, genetic testing and, and like we said, facial features and some of the, the knowledge that they carried with them, like rubber making from Africa, would point toward these two places that these seem that we can at least find evidence that these ancient cultures came from. The Paracas seem to have come from this, the, the Turkey Black Sea Caucasus area. Whereas, but, but the Olmecs seem to have come from Western Africa. So there's these two different points where they're coming from, but it's not really what we think of, right? It's not like a, a group of really primitive people are on this canoe and they somehow get the right wind and they travel all the way across the ocean and they get here and they're like, this is beautiful. Let's just create a culture. And they make some tents and they start forging off the land. No, they come here, whoever these people were, like the Olmec or the pre-Olmec, and they create these incredible stone heads that are in some case 40 tons each. So it tells me, and it's in a similar way to the Paracas people, that this isn't just a primitive group that's just randomly deciding to come here. This is an extremely sophisticated group of people that is leaving where they were for a very particular reason. And we've speculated on what those reasons might have been. You brought up war and being pushed out from persecution. But what, I'm, what I want to get to is, let's go to the heart of these locations then. Let's go and discuss now, talk about places like Egypt. Because when we just mentioned that the Olmecs seem to have these African traits. And when we think about where these elongated skulls are found all around the world, and we look at sophisticated, the sophisticated structures that have been built from these cultures, we find that in Egypt, when we look at a, lot of, at a lot of these older structures surrounding the pyramids and even in some of the old tombs, we find depictions in many cases of elongated heads in Egypt. It's one of the best places where you can really see that, not only in skeletal structures that have been, skulls that have been found, but actually in murals depicting these very, very tall heads. So I wanted you to expand a little bit on whether or not you think that this is the same situation as we find with the Paracas skulls, where there's this noble certain kind of a special bloodline that seems to be related. Is that what your evidence on Egypt has, has shown you? Yeah, well, the, in, in general, the elongated head depictions in Egypt tend to be from the, uh, the time period of Akhenaten. And um, so he, he had his, his daughters portrayed as having elongated heads. And that would have to be based on some kind of actual evidence that the artist would have had knowledge of. Um, the curious thing about Akhenaten is that I think what he was doing is he was portraying his family lineage. I don't think he necessarily had an elongated head or elongated skull because his, his body, his, his mummy has never been found. But um, I think what he was intimating at was that he comes from a long line of nobility back to the time of Osiris himself. Osiris is very often depicted as having an elongated head. So I, I think that that's what he was portraying because he was a student of the great mystery schools of ancient Egypt. Being the, the pharaoh, he had access to all information. And compared to most of the other pharaohs who were rather egotistical and wanted to be portrayed as being, you know, large and powerful, etc. cetera. He, he just told his artist, portray me the way I am, because in some of his uh, sculptures, he looks very effeminate or, you know, uh, very feminine looking. Whether he was that way or not, we don't know. But that's the major time period of, um, of where you find the depictions of elongated heads in Egypt. But also the problem is that so much of the knowledge has been um, erased or is being covered up at this time. Um, Akhenaten was deposed, and those that took over from him tried to eradicate him from the historical record. That's why almost all the artifacts pertaining to him have been found recently, in the last 100 years or so, in excavations, because almost every sculpture or portrayal of him is damaged in some kind of way. His, uh, his name was erased from the, the, king, the great king's list, 
and actually the entire 18th dynasty was erased from that. So, um, and who knows what is hiding in the basement of the great museum in Cairo. Now that they're finishing off the Grand Egyptian Museum on the Giza Plateau, which will be the largest one building museum in the world, we're hoping they're going to bring out some artifacts that are out, you know, out of place artifacts and put them on display that will give us uh, more clues into um, the lost ancient high technology used in the pre-dynastic time to do all the great constructions. But we'll have well, to wait and see. Well, I mean, it's, it's difficult when you hear that, what you just said, that the idea that we have all of this, these artifacts, and all of these potentially ancient tablets, and whatever they are, just remaining in certain places that are off limits, you know, maybe whether or not it's the Vatican or like you said, the back of the Cairo museum or what used to be in the, uh, the, li the library of antiquities, um, the Baghdad museum after the wars, these, these relics are, are clearly pointing towards like you all, what we talk about are these, these lost civilizations and the influences that may have led to them. So I wanted to ask you based on looking at it that way, these influences of these lost civilizations. You brought up how Akhenaten is talking about how in these murals, he's being depicted with an elongated head because even if, even if he didn't actually had an elongated head, he's talking about a bloodline that goes back to potentially the time of Osiris. And then we have these places like the Osirion and um, Osiris's tomb and all these things that have been built and named after this incredible being, deity, whatever you want to call it. And so much sophistication went into building these structures. In some cases, like we briefly mentioned in the last discussion, these giant stone boxes, these granite boxes that nobody's buried in, but it's called something like the tomb of Osiris. How does that work in terms of our understanding of this? So if, if that culture had the influences of these bloodline influences from these much, much earlier um, wisdom bringers, these influences like Osiris. Are you implying, or maybe you can expand on a little bit, does that mean Osiris was a real being? Does that mean that Horus was a real being? Does that mean that Thoth was a real being? At what point do we use this as a symbolic way to look at archetypes, or were these actual beings? Well, I, I think that... Uh that Osiris and Isis were probably real beings. I'm not, and, and I'm not necessarily saying human beings. They were ancient beings because that has to be, these stories have to be based on something. Too often um, academics will say, well, it's just, it's just fictional. You know, these, these stories, these uh, portrayals were made up in the distant past by somebody. But usually fiction is based on on actual facts, on actual people and actual beings. And again, that's the problem that we have, some of us have with Egyptology and academia in general is they try to explain, these things they can't explain, they try to explain away anyway. So uh, for example, the, the Os Osiris shaft, which is a shaft that goes down 200 feet vertically into the bedrock. Zahi Hawass, who was the leader of Supreme Antiquities in Egypt, kept stating that it was a symbolic tomb. It wasn't a tomb itself, it was symbolic. It's like, who carves into the bedrock 200 feet underground to make something symbolic? It obviously had to have had a function to, uh, you know, to have been constructed in the first place. So they try to you know, whitewash reality by coming up with, with their own uh, fictitious ideas which you know used to drive me nuts i don't really care anymore i'm just happy that we're able to access these places yeah well i i just want to add on that just because people are going to yell at me if i don't does that imply that these boxes these stone tombs these stone sarcophagi could that have been some kind of a resurrection like chamber to if i mean if these beings just you know to go beyond to the next level here if they if if they want to continue on their lives over and over again and try to exist in, in this reality. I mean, what would have been the pur purpose of the Osiris shaft and these stone sarcophagi? Do you want to maybe speculate a little bit? Sure. Well, of course, the, the standard explanation is that the, uh, I don't call them sarcophagi, I just call them big boxes. Yeah, because there's no one in them, right? Yeah, well, there's no, no one was ever found in them. They're much, much larger than a human being. 
So uh, the conventional story is that uh, the ones in the Serapium at Sakharath, which there are 23 that were basically finished and two unfinished, was that they were the burial places of sacred Apis bulls. That's where the name for the Serapium comes from. No evidence of a bull has ever been found in any of the boxes. All of the boxes were found in, in the 19th century with the lids ajar, so shifted out of position. One was found sealed, and so they, they wound up taking gunpowder and blowing it up in order to find out what was inside, and they found nothing. Uh, another story was that there was a, a mummified bull from the Serapium in the Museum of Agriculture in Cairo, but our early guide went to the museum and asked the custodians of where he could see the bull. And they said, we have no idea what you're talking about. So there's no evidence that there ever was one. Um, they weigh up to a hundred tons. They were made, uh, each box was made from one piece of stone. So the lid and the box itself are from one piece of stone. The quarry is at least 400 miles away. So how would they transport them? How would they get them in? You know, this is an underground complex. How would they get them into the tunnel system uh, you know, where they're located now. There's no soot on the ceiling, so what kind of artificial light was used? Um, and the, the most amazing thing is that on our March tour of this year, our, um, our new Egyptologist, which is uh, a permanent part of our team now, he kept taking me off to the side and, and telling me little stories that he didn't want the group to hear because uh, but he decided he wanted to tell me. So he said that when the Serapium boxes were first studied uh, by a foreign archaeologist, humanoid bodies were found in them that looked like they had been barbecued or that they'd been cooked from very intense heat. So that leads me to believe, and he didn't, you know, I said, were they big? Were they small? He said, I don't know. I haven't seen them, but it's a story that, that was passed down to him. And, uh, so it, it would seem that they weren't being used for burial, but they were being used as some kind of teleportation device. And uh, it looks like they got overstimulated by energy. And the unfortunate thing is that victims were, you know, cooked alive inside some of these boxes. So that, that you know, that's not a story that you find in, uh, in the, the common literature or anything, this was just this, you know, this guy who has access to amazing information telling me these little stories so that I could pass them on, you know, without mentioning his name or his position or anything like that. Because, of course, he doesn't want, he wants anonymity, but he's, he wanted the information out. So that's why I'm telling you about it. So you think that these boxes and these devices down deep into the bedrock, right, surrounded by maybe like these aquifer systems, had something to do with that, like possibly a teleportation device, or is that is that what you said? I think either that or and or they were used for regeneration. So it's possible that they date back to the earliest time of of constructions in Egypt, again at least thirteen thousand years ago. Maybe they were for the original builders to re-energize themselves um, at night, and or they were used to physically tele like teleport bodies like in Star Trek, from one point to another. I, I know it sounds bizarre, but that, that's what they're indicating, um, not as tombs. There's been so much recycling during dynastic times of, of ancient uh, locations that predate the dynastic people. Of course, many were used as tombs, but as you've indicated, as far as we know, none of these large boxes ever contained a body. And also in the Valley of the Kings, there are these massive shaft systems that go down, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet at a gentle slope carved into the bedrock. Again, the standard story is that the dynastic people made them, which is probably impossible because they're so big, you know, giant cavernous things. And at the end of each one is one of these 100 ton boxes showing cataclysmic damage, like a corner would be blown off or in some cases, giant holes in the side blown out. Um, so yeah used by dynastic people as tombs, but not created originally as tombs. So <laughs> what you just said was phenomenal. And I just want to say, I really truly appreciate someone like you in the position you're in to have the courage to be able to just go a little beyond this mainstream, even, even the edge of the mainstream view where, okay, we're accepting the fact there might've been older cultures, but what about this next level, right? 
talking about these influences of these beings like Osiris and what these structures, these um, incredibly um, sophisticated building underground labyrinths were for. But this is what gets me excited. You know, when people come up to me and they're like, you write about ancient history and you talk about ancient history, no, no big deal. You're just talking about linear culture developing and figuring out things a little bit and creating some structures and they were just for tombs of pharaohs and that's it. But what gets me excited is, no, that's not what this story is at all. And I just want to lay this out there. We're talking about a labyrinth system underneath Egypt that is potentially much more extravagant and significant even what's on the surface. Here we have a situation where the Great Pyramid of Giza is the largest and most sophisticated structure that we've ever seen built. And yet underneath Egypt, we have potentially even more sophistication that is on a completely different level, or at least built in, during the same time period, connected to the Sphinx, where incredible sophistication and, and work went into excavating these massive labyrinths into the bedrock, specifically into the bedrock, down into these aquifer systems, connecting tunnels, and then creating these massive stone, uh, not tombs, you could call them boxes, right? These these boxes that seem to be yeah. bizarre and strange that we have no idea what they're for. But if we were to use our logic and almost go on like a science fiction perspective, we're talking about something that was probably, in my opinion, and I agree, was used as a way to somehow re-energize your energy and, and maybe live longer and, and, and maybe – Maybe you're about to die. We've seen so many depictions of some great king in some science fiction story that, or whatever that's going to that's gonna pass on and die. But instead, he goes into some kind of a chamber, and then he's back, and his, his physical body has been recharged, and he can live again. I mean, this is bizarre stuff. This is almost beyond even what we can comprehend because we, we, we weren't alive during that time. But this is... The one, this isn't really a question. I'm just excited because this information is so fantastic that you really get into like a science fiction like world, don't you? Oh, you do. You do. And, you know, there's more. That's the great thing. There, <clears throat> the new antiquities uh, minister is opening these ancient sites up in a very kind of controlled manner. The Osiris shaft was prohibited to the public up until three years ago. But now if you spend $2,400, you can rent the Osiris shaft for two hours. And so that's what we've done twice so far. We're going to be doing it again in March. Um, and on this most recent trip, we were able to go under the step pyramid um, at Saqqara. Um, you know, it's, it's not sophisticated in terms of how it was made, but again, that's, that's the cool thing about this because they've opened up the interior of it. So you go down a staircase, and then you walk several hundred feet uh, you know, into the bedrock, and then you look down and you see a, the remains of a massive multi, multi-ton box at the base of, of the of this shaft that, that goes down. And uh, again, the same Egyptologist guide we had said that one t at one time, he was able to go down into the complex itself, and he said there's a megalithic city under the Step Pyramid. And he's, you know, he's not a guy who makes things up. He's, a, he's an academic. He's a very logical guy. That's another one of these, Brian, come here, I have a story to tell you. And he said, you know, at present, that, of course, is off limits. But there's um, even Zahi Awas admitted that underneath the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, there are tunnels. One of them goes a mile and a half through the bedrock. And for, you know, for him to make that kind of claim means that there's a lot more going on. Also, our, um, our, friend, um, our friends, the Awiyan family, their father, Abdel Hakim, claimed that when he was a teenager, he was able to go into a shaft down and uh, go through a tunnel system. He walked, he swam, and he crawled all the way from Saqqara to the Giza Plateau, where he was able to come back out again. And uh, the evidence of that is that you go to the location where he claims he went into the shaft and they've poured concrete into it to seal it off. So, you know, this whole thing of trying to, you know, somebody makes a claim and then uh, the government either says, no, 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 it didn't exist or, or they do something physically 
like filling it up with concrete to make sure that you don't get access to it. But I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very happy that some of these ancient sites are slowly opening up to us. Also the Osirion, which is at Abydos, uh, in a few months will be open to the general public. It's never been open to the public before. Uh, there were fears be because it tends to develop a pool of water in the bottom. Uh, the authorities were afraid that people would go down into it and then trip and fall and break a leg and then sue the government. But they're cleaning it out now. I got access to it in March for half an hour by myself. And it's a big, it's a big labyrinth that goes into the bedrock too. Uh, I've, I've got a video I recently put up on my YouTube channel about our, our trip uh, into the Osirion. So that's you, my favorite thing is that each time I go, I get to see something I've never seen before. It just seems like there's endless things coming out of Egypt, you know, let alone what's on the surface, but then what we have underground, which is somewhat unusual. I mean, around the world with these ancient sites, we see underground areas in like Derinkuyu, Turkey, but we don't really see these massive underground areas in parts, in a lot of places of in uh, South America with the Tiwanaku culture or the pre-Inca or up into the Americas. We just don't see this labyrinth system deep miles into the bedrock. Do you think that this had anything to do with this obsession that the ancient Egyptians had with the underworld and something about re resurrection and, and energy? Do you think that that played a role or what, what do you think the role was with creating these labyrinth, massive labyrinth systems under the ground? Well, I have no idea. You know, we can simply speculate, but the more you go to these locations, <clears throat> the more bits of information you pick up, especially if you have a local, um, expert like like uh, the one we have now but uh, even Zahi Awas stated that at least 80 percent of ancient Egypt is yet to be explored and that means that doesn't mean under the people keep thinking under the sand that there are sculptures and things that are you know lie buried under the sand that have to be that you have to sift away the sand in order to find them again we're talking underground complexes built in the bedrock and again when you're talking about tunnels going on for a mile and a half uh, you know, lots of stories of, of tunnel systems in Peru as well. But in Egypt itself, it seems like, seems like almost everything was built on purpose underground in pre-dynastic times, whether that was to protect them from, um, protect them from something, we don't really know. But that's why I'm very eager to go back and see what, uh, what else is, is uh, newly open for us. Uh, another little story again with this, uh, our, our new guide is that he went to, um, at, he went to a mountain behind Abydos. Abydos, again, is where the Osirion is located. And he said they entered into uh, a tunnel at 8 o'clock in the morning and came out at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and I said, where's that? And he, he pointed to the mountain. It's back there. Of course, you're not allowed to go there now. But uh, he's special in that with his connections, he's been able to see things that almost nobody else in modern times has ever seen. But he tells the stories, and he's very credible. That's just, um, just amazing. Now, Brian, I know we don't have a lot of time left, so I just want to get a couple quick ones in here that may not have quick answers, but you know, do the best you can with whatever time you have available. I just want you to speculate on this. Well, everything that we just described with this sophistication and these royal noble bloodlines connecting to these what seem like genetically we're sh are showing our non-human remains and these skulls that are look non-human based on genetic experts and not and we're finding non-human actual dna what do you, how do you think that could be connected to let's say who were these knowledge bringers that came over and built those structures and for instance the god of the aztec you know quetzalcoatl and the god of the maya kukulkan and this god of the pre-inca tiki tiki viracocha viracocha and then over in egypt we've got this god of Os osiris and in and in i have to mention but in mesopotamia they called them their gods the anunnaki gods and so on or all over the world do you think that these beings were real beings that came here and that's why we see this just emergence of learning about mathematics and agriculture and astronomy. Is that why we just see this going from hunter gatherers to just advanced civilizations in what seems like overnight? Yeah, I think, I think uh, very definitely that there were ancient visitors that came to locations such as Sumeria 
and Egypt and, um, and Peru and Mexico and Bolivia that came as great teachers and introduced uh, advanced agriculture and sciences and metallurgy and things like that and then left. Um, as, as you stated, in Mexico you have uh, Cuculcan and also Quetzalcoatl and then in Peru you have Tiki Viracocha or also Viracochan um, and I think they were living, breathing beings that came and educated. The funny thing is that um, if you look on, on a map, and you, you look at the path that, uh, that the, the ancient teacher Viracocha took. He went from southeastern Bolivia to northwestern Peru. And then when he reached this, the ocean, then he, uh, he left in some kind of boat or whatever. But if you follow that line, it goes straight through the, the parts of Mexico where you find the, the worship of Kukulkan and Quetzalcoatl. So I think they were the same characters uh, with different names because of course as you, as they would move from one culture to another they would be called something different um, so yeah I think definitely they you know people again people keep saying well they're just fictitious but um, how, how can you explain the, you know these r rather primitive cultures suddenly going into <clears throat> having this incredible knowledge of astronomy agriculture metallurgy etc if that <clears throat> excuse me, wasn't introduced by some great teacher because the evolution is way too fast. Exactly. And, and I, again, I just want to say, I truly appreciate someone in, in your standing to be able to acknowledge that there's so many that are on the edge here that just won't come out to acknowledge that because it throws them into some kind of a box automatically where, you know, as a conscious species here, we can't just be open-minded and, and discuss things. We have to have this paradigm where People can't waver from one end to another. But to me, the evidence, like you've stated, is overwhelming. That it's, it, it's very clear, especially in a place like Gobekli Tepe, where you can go down through the layers of organic matter and rock and different debris and see this point where, yeah, we're finding artifacts where they were hunter-gatherers here. But then all of a sudden, right above that layer is sophistication in agriculture and all these incredible things. You can't do that from an evolutionary standpoint. You can't just go from being primitive to incredibly advanced out of nowhere. There has to be this missing link. And I think that more mm -hmm. researchers out there, and I'm not going to name any names, but they need to just see this and we need to all come together to agree that that would be impossible. Ideas can't come out of nowhere, especially when they're so sophisticated that they're literally like the blueprints for civilization. That seems to be where this is at. Now, Brian, I want to ask you one major question le left here that then ties all of this together and ends it. The one very strange thing that connects to places like the Osirion and a lot of this strange technology we see back in, back in uh, antiquity is all over the world in these ancient sites, specifically where we find megalithic work and sophisticated building, we find these doorways from Nashi Rostam in Iran to Petra Jordan to Madain Saleh in, in Saudi Arabia, um, all the way to Erumuru in, 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 um, near Lake Titicaca and the Gate of the Gods and the Gate of the Sun. Can you maybe speculate on what you think the purpose of these gates were? In, in, in terms of Erumuru, for those who don't know, it's a 23 foot tall gate clearly far bigger than any person would, would walk through. Do you think based on the evidence and what we were saying with these boxes and all these things, what would you speculate those gateways purposes were? Symbolic or not? No, again, I think um, any of these places were built so far back in antiquity and then were inherited. So uh, the Inca adopted Amaru Muru as a, as a temple of some kind or you know, symbolic temple, but it, it would appear that it could have been originally used as some sort, of, some sort of energy teleportation device of some kind. The stone is red sandstone, so it's very high in quartz crystal and also iron. Uh, and you know, those, those are vibrational materials. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then you, yeah, the sites in I, th I think the sites in Petra and Saudi Arabia and the nearby locations 
I think they were all created by the same culture way back in time. Uh, the ones in Saudi Arabia only recently has anyone from outside Saudi Arabia been allowed to come and, and visit them. But uh, some of the chambers there are just massive. You know, again, we're talking carved out of bedrock. There's no way they could have been done with hand tools. Um, and you keep being told that uh, this, this culture called the Nabataeans built, made them about 2,000 years ago with chisels. And it's like some of the chambers at, at Petra are 300,000 cubic feet in size. Amazing. Yeah, how, how are you going to do that? So yeah, that's, the, you know, the, the one thing is, you know, is t always to question. Um, when you go to a location and you have a guide, ask questions because our guide in Petra kept insisting it was made by the Nabataeans and I, you know, using maybe iron chisels or something, but you see the sheer scale of it. Petra's seven miles long. Amazing. And uh, I kept saying, no way, they, they couldn't have done it. He kept defending himself. And it's like, why can't you open yourself up to admit that I'm looking at machine marks inside these chambers. I'm looking at machine marks on these walls. Uh, it does, you know, the same thing in, in Cusco. The first time I went to Cusco and I saw the megalithic sites, it's like, I used to be involved in construction and I asked my guide who made this stuff. And he said, the Inca. I said, that's impossible. And that's what started my whole interest in this was, was Cusco and the megalithic stuff. And it's just, you know, it's expanded to many locations around the world. My whole job is simply to present what I find and um, that's it. It's just, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, like I said, connecting to Egypt and all these other sites with these bizarre walls with knobs sticking out that we have no idea what, why they would make those, but it seems to have some kind of an energetic vibrational principle to it. And, and then, like you said, these giant doorways carved right out of the rock that seem to have no purpose from something in a linear standpoint that we can see. And yet in throughout it, in, in antiquity, we see that these cultures emerged out of nowhere with sophisticated technology. And it really leads me to the idea that maybe these ideas of science fiction that we see, things like stargates and having energy be resurrected and, and returned again back into this realm, it really is like something out of a book that we're going to have to really um, wrap our heads around and try to rewrite in the future. And that book is called The Epic of Humanity because we just have so many anomalies and strange things in our story that I feel like there's only going to be a lot more questions rather than answers, Brian. Um, what should just leads me to the last point I want to make is, and do you think, do you think that in your lifetime that this paradigm is going to erode and change, or do you think it's going to be in future lifetimes? Uh, no, I, it is, uh, the standard paradigm is eroding because <clears throat> the more that the more people look at these places from, a you know, non brainwashed, um, ed education point of view, the more questions that are asked about how is this possible by the cultures you're talking about, then the more that, you know, that rather flimsy story, which was so heavily believed is falling apart. And uh, again, the Egyptian um, Egyptologist guy that I, I've been mentioning throughout this talk, he's one of that generation. He's probably about 15 years younger than me. So he's, he's part of a, of a generation that knows this stuff, that knows that their history is far more complicated than what they've been taught. Uh, and the fact that the new leader of the Supreme Council of Antiquities is actually unlocking doors rather than locking doors uh, means that more and more as time goes on, this stuff is leaking out. And that, that's the function of my, of my YouTube videos is to simply present what it is I'm looking at and questioning. Um, and there's, you know, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that there were very advanced technological civilizations in different parts of the world uh, existing at a time when there was supposed to be no cultures at all. You know, we're going yeah. twice far back as ancient Egypt at, at the minimum. <clears throat> That's it's just absolutely amazing. And I'm ex incredibly excited for everything you just said, this unveiling of the truth and this breaking down of the old paradigm and accepting new evidence. And finally, and like you said, this changing from these levels of authority where 
there's a new antiquities person involved in Egypt and we have these new guides, these tour guides that have a different mindset than the old, the old ways. And it's all eroding all around us. And I, I truly appreciate being here during that time when we can have this unveiling of the truth and everyone go, Oh my God, I never would have thought. And you, people like you and I were like, we've been trying to tell you this, this stuff guys for years and years and years, but it is exciting to be here during this time. Brian, can you just tell everybody, um, you know, what kind of projects and things you have planned for the future? Sure. Well, we're going to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, going to Egypt in March. Uh, this, you know, this whole spamdemic thing that's been going on um, in, you know, I monitor different countries, you know, that I'm going to be going to. The, the number of cases have, have basically collapsed in Egypt. So it's, it's just a downhill trend, get, heading close to zero now. No chance of there being a second, you know, so-called second wave or whatever. So by the time we're going to be going to Egypt, I think it'll be mask-free and everything. Uh, and anyone's allowed to go to Egypt now if they want to. Everything's opened up. Uh, in Peru's opening up very rapidly now. Bolivia is completely open. So uh, I'm looking forward to Egypt in March, possibly Malta right after that. Uh, then um, three trips in Peru and Bolivia in June, August, and November. And yeah, we'll have to just have to see what else um you know what else uh, turns up in the in the coming weeks and months but i'm very confident that uh this whole year that's been a disaster is uh, is going to have a very bright um bright dawn bright sunrise next year and um looking forward to exploring and sharing all of this with uh with those who wish to come and attend. And for those who can't attend, then that, that's why we have videos and that's why we have books. Well, that's great, Brian. I, I really do hope that one day I can be with you on one of those sites and be able to walk through some of these areas. Um, I really do think that this ancient megalithic lost civilizations of our world needs to be mapped, needs to be cataloged. We need to be able to start putting all this down into data and start putting together this missing story because it, it's all just looming there. It's all these just pieces all broken up, showing these different levels of sophistication of, and, and how, how far back our story truly goes. So I truly, I really do appreciate all the work you're doing. I consider you a hero in terms of our time period. I really do appreciate it, Brian. Um, just last question, Brian. Thank you so much for sitting down to talk to me. Where can people find your books and information um, about your upcoming trips? Okay, everything about me is at hiddenincatours.com. So 98% of the information on that website is, is free. And that's where you get access to <clears throat> also the future tours that are coming up. Um, connections to all of the 1500 plus YouTube videos, the 37 books, you know, articles, photographs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So hiddenincatours.com is where you can find everything. And don't forget to go to Brian Forrester's YouTube page, as he said, He's got an absolutely phenomenal videos where he goes down into all these sites and he gets to catalog and show all these places. And it really is quite an adventure to go, go with him on those trips. So thank you so much, Brian, for sitting down, taking time on your busy schedule to talk to me. This was a really fantastic discussion and I'm glad we can share that with everybody. And hopefully we can do this again uh, soon in the future. Oh, you bet. Thanks again, Matt. I'm, I'm glad that you're one of the one of the ones looking uh, for the truth as well. I'm glad there are thousands, if not millions of others that are doing this now. It's really uh, evolving very, you know, people are waking up really fast now. Um, I'm glad to be one contributor to that, but it's not just me, there are many, many, many. And um, yeah, uh, maybe when I come back from Egypt then we can have another one of these chats and I'll show you what it is that I found on that trip. Fantastic, let's definitely do that. Thanks so much, Brian, until next time. Okay, pleasure. Thank you, Matt.